Hey everyone, I've been working with the digital audio workstations for almost 30 years. I've uh, used them all. And here is my top 10 list of uh, tips for the most fast and efficient way of using them. One, project templates. Have a template file already set up with all your most used routings, effect sense, inserts, folder tracks, group tracks and name everything accordingly. This is what I always start out with, a template file, which helped me get started fast and efficient. I live by this for every single project I, I make. Uh, and I'll go through what I have in my template file. First of all, I have my different instrument categories uh, set up in folder tracks. I'm using Cubase as my door. So I have folder tracks for drums, bass, synths, guitars, vocals, and a MIDI folder as well. I also have a folder for um, sound effects and for VST instruments. And uh, inside these folder tracks, I have already set up different recording tracks and named them accordingly. Uh, so in the drums folder tracks, I have a, uh, a audio uh, recorded ready track for kicks, snare, hi-hats, toms, and crash. And I have uh, the similar for bass, and I have for synths, and stuff like that. The most uh, used synth sounds I use in my, in my music. So yours will be different, of course, but this helps me put things in and start recording on the, on the corresponding track right away, so I know where everything is from the get-go. So after I've recorded some, some sounds and uh, stuff, it will look something like this. I'll have some kicks and snares, etc and things in the different categories for, uh, for different parts of the song I'm working on. And uh, if I go into my mixer window, you can see that I've set up uh, group tracks uh, in my mixer window here. I have a group track for kicks, for snare and for drums. Uh, this is the, the drum thing. I have uh, a group track for the bass uh, I'm about to record. I have a group track for synths and for guitars and a couple for vocals uh, because some of these will be my main vocals, some will be background vocals, etc. And I will name them, rename them as I go along. And I also set up uh, my most used insert effects on some of the group channels. I try to use as few insert effects as possible to save CPU throttling, but if you have a, a powerful CPU processor, you can of course uh, use a lot more inserts uh, at the same time than I can on this 20 year old system, but I have enough power to, to do what I want on this system. Regardless, uh, so on my kicks, I have a, um, a drum plugin here, same for the snare. And on my, uh, my drums uh, group here, which will be a sort of, um, yeah, every drum uh, in, in the arrangement will go through this as well, which I've set up for some parallel compression. So I have some uh, dynamics going on here and I'll probably add more as I go along. These are the, the plugins I usually would have ended up putting into these group channels anyway. I have them in my templates. Uh, I also have set up lots of different send effects uh, already in my template. Studio chorus, my delays, some reverbs and some gated reverbs, another delay and some pitch shifting, etc. Things I always use on my different separate tracks in my, um, in my music. I also have one VST setup in my template. This is just so I can straight away uh, play on my master keyboard and get some sounds going if I want to check out chords or whatever before I start uh, messing around with that. And I also have one MIDI channel, MIDI track enabled so I can uh, start recording MIDI straight away if that's what I want. And in my template, I've also set up my recording buses and mixing buses coming in and out of my audio interface. Two, color code everything. This is something I've done for decades and I've used these same colors for decades. And it means that I have my uh, folder tracks and separate tracks color coded for the instrument group I'm working on, recording or mixing. In my case, uh, I have drums in red always and bass in blue, synths in orange, guitars in green and vocals in yellow. I can vary the, 
the color of the MIDI folder or MIDI tracks, but usually inside this folder, I'll have the MIDI tracks correspond with the colors for the type of uh, VST instrument I'm recording. So if I'm recording a MIDI bass, that will also be color coded uh, uh, blue in the, in the MIDI track, which is uh, doing the bass. And uh, this means that when I pull out a old project, maybe from 25 years ago, I can instantly see uh, what is what, what is where. I know that my drums will be in the red folder. The main thing is to never uh, change those colors, so you'll always know what is what. So I don't have to use that little part of the brain to figure out where things are in the arrangement. Three. Set your gain structure inside your DAW. And this is a controversial topic in the world of DAWs. Some people believe that there is no such thing as um, gain structure within a DAW with the uh, 32-bit floating point processing and um, almost unlimited dynamic range. You don't have to gain structure anything in the DAW as you would on a analog console. But I found that uh, when I manage my uh, gain structure inside my door for my project, my mixes sound better. And what I mean by gain structure is that in my case here, I never let any plugin uh, go into the red. That's I don't uh, oversaturate my plugins with levels. And I always keep my eye on the master output here to make sure that I'm not uh, peaking. Uh, higher than minus six, 6 dB on my scale in my door here, and I never touch my master fader, it always stays at zero. So if I just start up a, uh, a track here, let's check this out. You can see that on my individual separate tracks inside my project window. Uh, I don't peak my levels, my master output, uh, never goes uh, above minus 6 dB on my scale here. If it does, I don't adjust my master fader. I might touch the faders uh, in the mixer window here, but what I'm talking about is setting the gain structure at the input of each channel. So I've set all of my separate tracks to minus 4 dBs, and my group tracks I've set to uh, minus 10 dBs, and also with my um, Send effects, my auxiliaries, I've also set them to minus 4 dB uh, at the top of the mixer window here. And that means I can leave the separate faders alone. And I rarely have to adjust anything here because I've set the gain level structure up here. And I always record my tracks uh, as loud as possible without clipping in the analog realm, uh, going into the audio interface. And as such, they never clip once inside the door. I never let my plugins go into the red. This is set up just for an example. You can see it's peaking here, and I never allow that because I find that when I do that, my uh, mixes start to build up. It builds up over time, and the more and more these faders go into the red, the more congested and um, lifeless and dull my mixes become. So I've always done it like this for 30 years, and I know it's controversial, some doesn't swear by this at all, but I do. Four, have your bus compressor on, on your master output, from the get-go. And this is of course optional, but I always mix work from the get-go with my bus compressor turned on. And it's taking about, yeah, two or three dBs at the ratio of two or four uh, to one. And it will sound something like this. And as you can see, it doesn't take all that much, but I like to hear what my mixes uh, will sound like with the bus compressor on from the get-go up until the finished uh, mixed track uh, before going to mastering and I found that my mixes uh, turn out better that way than if I uh, turn on the bus compressor at the very end and uh, then I'll have to do a lot of adjustments between the separate tracks to get the sound I want. This way I'm working uh, 
step by step, hearing exactly what I want my final mix to, to sound like. So the bus compressor on while I'm working is my tip number four. Five, use custom key shortcuts to minimize your time with the mouse. I like to use the mouse as little as possible while I'm working. And I found that uh, using custom key commands is much, much faster and I use them a lot. Uh, I have in my uh, case, my Cubase setup, uh, changed out a lot of different key commands from the factory yeah, standard in Cubase. And I also like to um, import my custom set of key commands uh, from my uh, main door here, Cubase or Nuendo, into more modern versions of Cubase Nuendo. So I can have the same set of key commands in my, uh, on newer machines if I ever uh, have to work on those. Six, constantly check for mono compatibility to avoid phasing issues and to make sure your mix sound good on any sound system. So I have my, uh, my mixer here, my SSL6, and I always press the mono button here to check my mixes for, um, for how they sound in mono on my little Logitech desktop speaker, which emulates a mobile phone perfectly. At the same time, I will always also check for the bass, if it sounds good, if it's coming through on my little desktop speaker, because if it does, it will also sound good on a mobile phone or a small playback device that some of my end listeners might listen to. So I always go back and forth between mono and stereo to check that all my sounds in my arrangement are coming through nicely. And you can easily do this in the door as well with a mono plugin on your master output, which you can then turn on and off to go between mono and stereo when you're listening. Seven, use clip gaining instead of level automation. And this will also be kind of controversial. Uh, automation has been used since the 80s on bigger consoles where you'd uh, automate fader moves in several passes to, uh, to finish your mix, so to speak. Uh, and you can do the same thing in, in your DAW. You have in all DAWs, you have uh, things going from uh, volume automation to, yeah, you can, you can automate pretty much any parameter in your DAW. But I don't use that much at all, hardly ever. I prefer to use clip gaining. That means that if I have a um, track here uh, where I have some um, different levels of uh, volume maybe coming from the recording part of the session. Maybe this is a guitarist or whatever, a piano player, acoustic piano. Some parts are played hard, some are played soft, some are played in the middle. And you want to automate these uh, volumes, these levels. Uh, I never use the automation feature of my door. I go in and adjust the gain settings of each of those clips until they line up. I use my ears, of course, uh, not my eyes here, but I use the eyes to, uh, to set a sort of level I think will work, and I listen with my ears. This is how I go through different parts of an instrument or a vocal and line them up perfectly. And uh, I, found, uh, I find I get much better results doing it this way. Also remember that clip gaining happens before anything. It happens before send effects, auxiliaries, etc. So you're doing this on the raw material before it hits any, anything in your, um, in your mixer chain, so to speak. Uh, and as such, I don't have to uh, mess around or change levels of send effects, etc. Afterwards, uh, I came from the analog world with consoles and uh, mixer boards, but I find clip gaining vastly superior to volume automation in a DAW. Eight, use a custom hardware controller to set levels and adjust panning. And I have here my Steinberg CC121, which I've had for years. I use it only for two things, and that is setting levels as I go along, work on my mixes with this fader here, which is also motorized. And this uh, uh, knob here, which I use to uh, control my, uh, my pans on instruments. When I want to pan something hard left or hard right, it's much easier to uh, use this. I use this a lot. Nine. 
save constantly to avoid losing hours of work. And by that I mean, in my case, the finger combination, control S. Check out my uh, cursor here. I put it up here. I'm pressing control S right now. Saved. I save constantly to um, never lose anything and to make sure I, uh, I have a backup, so to speak, I go into save as and um, rename once in a while uh, with an increment of one as a file name plus number. So that way I can always go back if something happens to that file, corrupts that file, I can go back hopefully not many minutes in my project. Some systems have a feature called auto saving where you set a um, time interval and the computer will save the file automatically. I don't like that, I don't use that because some software will hang upon saving a bug or whatever. So I decide when to save so I don't have to um, be in the middle of something very important. The computer decides to save and everything hangs but save as much as you can. And my 10th and final tip is use your ears. We have them here and not your eyes, which we have here. Turn off your monitor display on your door once in a while or look away or both and listen with your ears. It's so easy to visually try to adjust your mixes. With your mouse or keys, you'll change the EQ or whatever because you see it on the screen. Don't do it, listen with your ears first. If you have other tips, please leave them in the comment section. If you agree with me or disagree with me, please leave your comments in the comment section if you like to. And I'll see you next time. I'm Espencroft, thanks for watching, cheers.